Sorry, I'm a little late. <coughs> the, um, our, our lecture today is going to focus on the upper <coughs> Mississippi, that is to say, the two of the three branches that we haven't looked at in detail yet. We've looked at the Missouri River. So today we're going to look more at the Ohio River and particularly on the Tiger Dam, but on a second dam that is in a way parallel to it, the Kinzua Dam. <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> uh, but the first thing we want to look at so will be the Ohio River and navigation on the Ohio River, because this was the, we might say, almost the central challenge for the Corps of Engineers uh, when they began their work in 1824, because the goal, you recall, was to open up that great waterway from New Orleans to Pittsburgh, and the problem in the lower part was, of course, the flooding, but the problem in the upper part was that there was often not enough water to allow transportation, to allow the boats to move upstream. And uh, so in the 19th century, there were various proposals. There were canals that were built around rapids and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but eventually, towards the end of the century, they developed a program of canalization of the Ohio, which means to turn it into a series of uh, dams and locks. And in the beginning, they used a very curious type of, of uh, dam called the sh essentially the Wicket Dam. And I may have shown one or two slides of that initially. I can't even remember. I think I did, but we'll look at it today in detail. So we're going to look at that, that, the navigation aspect first. Then, of course, uh, the Ohio uh, becomes a national flood problem. Uh, you recall there's a great flood in 1907 in Pittsburgh. Then there's the 1913 flood, which brings into being the Miami Conservancy. And then there's the great 1936 and 1937 floods. Uh, Professor Smith has spoken about these. Um, all of these then brought very large programs into being. So the second part of the lecture then will deal with the floods and the Tigert and the Kinzua Dam, K-I-N-Z-U-A. In your reading, I had assumed that there was a section on the Kinzua Dam, but there isn't, or at least it's a tiny little paragraph. Interesting story, we were writing this book, and uh, uh, if you repeat what I'm going to say now out the, outside the classroom, you may get me in trouble, but uh, the, our clients for this book were the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation. The Corps of Engineers was not too happy with having the Kinzua Dam in this book. We're going to put it back anyway, but uh, the ver version you have is the version we finally submitted. It doesn't have Kinzua Dam in it, but I'm going to lecture on it anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so you'll get some background. You'll understand why some people in the Corps, not all, not all, but some people thought that that shouldn't be in there. I think it should be in there, and you'll see why. Okay, let's have the first uh, slide, please, and uh, uh, we'll proceed. This. Um, <clears throat> Did I show you this slide before? It looks familiar. Okay, because this now is the time we want to we want to look at it in detail because you can see that that uh, <clears throat> the region we're going to talk about is where the great big ball is. Loss of uh, flood losses by regions, 1902 to 1937. So this includes, of course, the 1907 Pittsburgh flood and the 1913 one uh, that was so damaging around uh, uh, the, the Miami River, and then the 1936 and 37 floods. And you can see the, how uh, balanced, overbalanced that is in just the area we're going to be talking about. So it's a huge flood problem. Next slide on the right. <coughs> Next slide on the right. What? It's not coming forward. There we go. Is that the first one? Okay, this is the first one. Yep, yep. So <coughs> we're going to be talking about the floods, but we're also going to be talking about the navigation profile. And just an image to get us started. You can see this is the modernization, the dams that are there, just actually the last one near Cairo has just been finished a couple of years ago. And you can see that it is a series of steps and locks. The locks, of course, are nothing like the ones on the Columbia River, but overall they amount to more or less the same thing, <clears throat> a very great rise. 
but in small steps this time. So they're not the steps that would encourage one to think about power. And because this is a really high, uh, uh, high density transportation network, uh, the, the river, 40% of all inland transportation is carried on in the Ohio River. And so it's a very important, uh, and that's why the Corps focused on this, does still focus on it very strongly, and why the um, dams themselves are essentially navigation dams. Uh, and these dams indeed are not even really flood control dams. They are to some small extent, but basically they are navigation dams. Next slide, please. And what you see now is a typical scene from the middle of the 19th century on the upper Mississippi, on the Ohio, on the Missouri, the lower Missouri, where there was a very substantial steamboat traffic. This is really before the railroads took over, you might say, a lot of the, of the traffic. And uh, this uh, is actually, this picture is actually at La Crosse, Wisconsin, in the upper Mississippi River, but it's the same, I just don't have a good one for the Ohio, but it's the same kind of thing. It gives you a sense of what it was like in the, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, next slide on the right. And here is the basin, the Mississippi Basin, and what we're going to focus on, obviously, is the Ohio. I think you can see that without my hobbling over there, uh, just where we're going to be focusing on. So it's the um, Ohio and also the upper Mississippi. So that means where the Mississippi River comes from, although you could, you could argue that the main branch of the Mississippi is the Ohio. From the point of view of flow, it certainly is. But anyway, the name is, starts up there at, um, uh, in uh, Minnesota and comes down, joins then, is joined to the Ohio first and then to the Missouri. Next slide on the left. All right, now these strange gates. And um, the idea, uh, you imagine now a dam across the river, the Ohio River. And the idea is you have this, um, oh, to it. you have this, um, uh, whoops, uh, this was actually is called the wicket and is actually a piece of wood in this case and it is sitting up there and it is forming a dam. Next slide on the right. You, you actually now have a dam. You look at it in profile and you can see the, the distance, the top line, the top horizontal line there running from to the left and that is the water line. So that means that you have water behind there. There will be a lock also along with this but this is actually the dam and the whole idea is that when the water is low, you have this dam so that you can keep the, the river as a series of lakes. And then with a large difference, well, large difference, maybe 30 feet at most, 20 feet maybe. Uh, so <clears throat> you have this dam and then, I, I don't know whether you can see it down there. I'll try to get over there. You can see that what happens is that this is then pulled down the whole thing swings down so that the dam here is now lying in this position and this lever here, uh, this, uh, this bracket, is then lying in a horizontal position too. And now you have, in a sense, an open waterway. So when the flow is high, the water is just going through with very little, uh, very little resistance. And you can even run boats over it, although they can still run through the locks. And so it's a, it was a way of having essentially a temporary dam on a river where the flow can vary radically and can be, it was recorded at Cairo during the Great Flood of two million cubic feet a second, which is about three times the average flow of the lower Mississippi. But that was in the Ohio River. So you can get this immense flows coming there and that, that is what, uh, why they did not want to have a permanent dam like that. Much harder to, this way they let the the whole water go through. It's not a spillway, really. It's just opening up the whole waterway, practically. Next slide on the left. With these, these are called Chanoine dams, and they were invented in France, as the name implies, and they were uh, used in the 19th century. As you might imagine, they were terribly difficult to maintain. All of those, uh, all of those rotating joints that you need to make this mechanism work uh, along the river, submerged often under water and so forth, and then coming out of the water, so there was rust, there was, a, there was a rot with the wood, and a continual bumping with ships and so forth. So it was a difficult thing to maintain, uh, but it sort of worked uh, for about half a century. Here you see a map now of a 19, in 1920. So in the late 19th century, they instigated a system of getting rid of these slowly. 
and replacing them with a series of locks and dams of a more permanent type uh, structure. And uh, he, you get the sense of the whole thing. There's, there's of course, Pittsburgh, and down here is uh, that mispronounced city of Cairo, uh, and uh, where the river actually joins the Mississippi. So you have all this, this torturous route that the Ohio takes as it goes down to meet the Mississippi River. Next slide on the right. Well, this is another version of the same sort of thing. You can see that this is, uh, uh, this is now, I think that says 1905 or something there. And so all the way into the 20th century, they're still building these, uh, these strange sorts of dams, which are to allow the water to go through when, the, when, the, um, uh, when it's running full. And you can look at the, look at the foundation of that. It, it has to be throughout the whole river. Now you have to, the whole length of the river has to have this foundation. Uh, very uh, substantial, all wood, mo or mostly wood, with some gravel in there, stone in there. But a very complicated kind of construction, and one which was continuously uh, needed, as I said, needed maintenance. Next slide on the left. This is another type of, uh, of uh, these dams. This is called the bear trap. Those of you who regularly trap bears will probably understand why. I don't. But <coughs> Uh, it, it is, uh, nevertheless, you see how it works. Uh, this then bracket then falls down here and ends up here, and then this comes on top of it. So again, it's, it's sort of closing down and coming up. Uh, it, it obviously would be uh, practically impossible for a very high dam. It's, this is 12 feet high, so you see it's not much of a height. The river is quite wide. The Ohio River is quite wide. And so once again, these kinds of things were what were being done in the 19th and very early 20th century to try to keep the river, keep the flow of the river, or keep the level of the river high enough so that it could be uh, used for transportation at all times, even in the low late summer season, low water summer, next side, season. <coughs> Another view of the same uh, thing now in 1920, whatever it is, 29 I think, uh, when they finally instituted a modern system. In other words, they kept working, they've been working on this ever since about 1879, and the idea, uh, first with these wicket gates, then with a more substantial form, and uh, ending up with what they have now, which are more like what we're used to seeing in the Columbia River. Next slide on the left. Well, this is just a plan view, a general plan view, and you see what they had, these wicket gates here. Uh, here they had uh, an actual dam, now, and then these were the bear traps in here, so, and then the lock, the pro proper lock here. Next slide on the right. Very complicated kind of a system. And this is now what was done in the first uh, 30 years of the 20th century, uh, a series that's turned around. Pittsburgh's up on the left there, Cairo down on the right. So continuously building these steps now. Next slide on the left, which is what now exists. And this is all under the direction of the Corps of Engineers. And this, this map just gives you a little more insight into the, into the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The colored portions are the various districts of the Corps. And the dashed lines, this is, these are the civil districts, that is to say the civil engineering districts. And the dashed lines are the military districts. So that uh, <coughs> I suppose this if Canada invades, I guess the Corps is going to be right up there uh, preventing that, I suppose. But the, what concerns us, of course, are the colored markings. And you notice that there is a Nashville district and that the Nashville district includes the Tennessee Valley. So that you automatically see from this, I mean, they still have the Nashville district and uh, the only uh, direct responsibility the Corps has now is for the Cumberland River whereas the Tennessee is under TBA. Uh, next slide on the right. But the Corps still has legal responsibility for navigation on the Tennessee River, so it's quite a complicated story. This is just an image now of the new type of dams on the Ohio River. This is the Gallipolis Dam, which was built in the 30s. And uh, you see how strange it looks. It's got these gates that rise up, so that it, they're still allowing lots of water to go through, when, uh, uh, when the uh, river is running full, and then it, those drop down, those big drum gates drop down and form a dam uh, to stop the water, to, make, to keep the water high enough behind the dam for, for navigation. So these are, these are what are there on the, 
on the uh, river now. They don't look like that, but they're more they're fixed, permanent. They're none of this uh, none of this levering back and forth. Next slide on the left. Okay, so this just gives us an image now of where we have been and where we're going. So you see, of course, that uh, here we were last time, the Central Valley project. Then we were at the Columbia River up here, and then we were on the Missouri River with just a few but very big dams. We didn't deal with all the others. There are plenty of others, of course. The lower Mississippi, which has no dams at all, except there are many tributaries, the White, the Arkansas, and so forth. And now we're out, and then the Tennessee Valley, which you can sort of see down here like that. And uh, then this is the Ohio up here. And you can see all that line of dams. And then the upper Mississippi, which is the same sort of thing. These are essentially navigation dams. They serve some minor other purposes, but they're essentially all navigation dams. So we're, in effect, back to the central goal or the central mission that the Corps of Engineers had. Next slide on the right. All right, this is now the Ohio Valley. We want to concentrate on this now. And you can see those dams again located. And this is the whole valley, which, of course, includes the Tennessee Valley. Now, you can, you know, the Tennessee River comes into the Ohio just before the Ohio goes into the Mississippi. So there isn't too much of it that is actually uh, going into the Ohio until the very end of it. But uh, <coughs> this gives you the extent of that, uh, of that area. Next slide on the left. And now we come to our dam, which you've already heard something about, and we're going to look at now in some detail. So the 1936 flood, I just put this, as I use this in another context, but to the 1936 flood and Tiger Dam. Now Tiger Dam, you recall, wasn't really finished until 1938, so it couldn't uh, help the, this flood in 1936. It was not able to, to work that yet for that flood. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> So what had happened was, just to go back and retrace the history a little bit here, you recall now in 1933 with the new administration, all of these big dams that we've looked at, Fort Peck, Bonneville, Grand Coulee, um, uh, where, 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 and uh, of course the Central Valley Project with Friant and Shasta, were, su were suddenly put online. They were, had been partly surveyed and some of them had been partly designed, but they were suddenly uh, the, the mission was suddenly get people in the field, start building right away. And Tigert was the same way. Tigert was, was brought into, from your reading you'll remember, brought in in 1933 and they were already making surveys then and designing and getting ready, letting contracts in 1934 to build it. So Tigert is part of that initial thrust then that comes in the 30s with these big dams. And this is the biggest dam in the east that the Corps of Engineers has ever done. And so. Um, this was pushed in, and it, what, what happened was in 1936 with the, with the big flood in Pittsburgh, uh, there was the Flood Control Act, which brought into being, next slide, brought into being, um, uh, here's a, an image of that flood, just to remind you of all these floods, brought into being uh, a new act, the Flood Control Act of 1936, and a big plan for protecting Pittsburgh. Not just Tiger Dam, now that was already going on, but that was the only one, really, then. There were a few others, but that was the major one. And so, you have, in a way, you had these two periods we're talking about. First, the New Deal period, not stimulated directly by floods, but stimulated by the Depression and the need for work. And then uh, a second uh, issue coming also in the 30s, but really not picking up steam until after World War II. Next slide on the left. Now this, don't, you can't read this, this is one of these terrible slides you can't read, but I'll just locate you in it. Uh, here is Pittsburgh and the Ohio River coming in like that, and up in the north is the Allegheny, and down in the south is the Monongahela, and the Tiger Dam is right here, and the Kinzua Dam is up there that we're going to look at. They're parallel dams, the two biggest in a sense on this on these tributary to Pittsburgh, but what you're looking at is the plan that came out of the 1936 Act. Uh, and so it obviously not a, very little of that actually got built before World War II, but that was what the, the, the basis was laid for a very big set of projects that would then come into full force right after the war. So uh, that was the effect of that, next slide on the right, of, that, uh, of those floods. 
And so this is the, the general story, the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, the Pittsburgh floods and tributary dams. Now you remember, of course, that the Corps of Engineers had bitterly fought that idea, uh, starting with Humphreys, and had claimed that levees were the answer, whereas Ellet had, uh, in his report, had stated very clearly that there ought to also be tributary dams and other things. And uh, so uh, here is an example now, the Corps of Engineers suddenly now building a huge set of tributary dams for flood control. Now, the drainage network unit hydrograph has already been discussed, and the Upper Mississippi and the 1993 flood. Well, I'm going to talk briefly today about the Upper Mississippi, but the, we'll talk later on about the 1993 flood. That is uh, also, that is focused on the Upper Mississippi and the Lower Missouri. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so today, it's mostly the first line there. Next slide on the left. Now, just to get an idea, we talked about uh, precipitation and runoff, and this is a plot uh, of the uh, precipitation. Here you see it for the Tigert Valley. So this is the precipitation. It starts in 1949 and goes up to 1974. You can get this right off the USGS um, webpage, I guess, right, Jim? That's, this kind of stuff is, is all on there. And uh, <clears throat> so this tells you that a very substantial amount of the precipitation is in runoff, which translates right away into uh, the possibilities for floods. Uh, next slide on the right. Now this is in, um, out in, the, in Nebraska, little place Maple Creek, but it's an indication, it's the same kind of thing, that is to say, it's precipitation and runoff. I think that's right. You can correct me if I'm wrong on this. This is the precipitation now, and this is the runoff. So this tells you that there's not much runoff, that it's a very, very arid area and soaks up the water, I guess, all goes into, into groundwater. And therefore, you don't have the same kind of, the same kind of flash flood problem that you would have in the much more uh, rainy east. Uh, <clears throat> all right, next slide. Okay, now the Ohio Valley, if we take it as a whole, including the Tennessee Valley, uh, we found there are, there are two dams, really, that characterize the whole valley for us. I mean, that's oversimplification, of course, but it's uh, uh, the TVA and Wilson Dam. Wilson Dam, in a way, is, the, is what brings the TVA into being, or at least it's a major, uh, major uh, focus for that. And the Tiger Dam is the largest of these dams that are to protect Pittsburgh, and the first major one to be built in that whole system. Next slide on the right. Now I'm showing you, again, a cross-section of Norris Dam. Now the story of Tiger Dam really begins with the 308 report on the Tennessee uh, River, which was uh, of course, made by the Corps of Engineers. It was the first, I think it was the first 308 report to be completed. In 1930 it was completed, so well before the Roosevelt administration. And central to that report was a dam called Cove Creek, which was renamed eventually Norris Dam. And so the Corps of Engineers actually designed a dam there, uh, where Norris Dam is now. And uh, and uh, that uh, uh, design is almost identical to what you see there. It isn't exactly the same. The Corps had put in a, uh, a big barge lift to sort of justify it as a navigation dam, but it, it isn't a navigation dam at all. And that was removed in the Norris Dam. And the spillway was put in the middle of Norris Dam, whereas it had been a so on the side in, uh, uh, in the uh, Cove Creek design. But I show it because the, the core was in the late 20s studying the design of a tall, massive concrete dam uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the Cove Creek uh, site. And, uh, <clears throat> and this became the model for the Tiger Dam. In other words, they had, they had worked out the ideas themselves, thought about this, and so when it came time to design Tiger Dam, this is what they had in their, you might say, in their drawer. They pulled these drawings out, and they could follow them. Even though the Cove Creek Dam was taken away from them, it was given to the, it was given to the, uh, 
uh, to TVA, you recall, and you recall that the TVA or Morgan turned around and gave the design to the Bureau of Reclamation, a uh, kind of, um, uh, you might say, evidence of his uh, not complete love of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And so, next slide on the left. So the NARS dam is a, plays a, a, a role in this, and the, while it was being constructed, the people from Pittsburgh, who were in charge of Tiger Dam, uh, visited the site and were, in effect, uh, v uh, very much involved in following it as a way of preparing for the Tiger Dam. Actually, Naras Dam was, was done just a little earlier than Tiger, not, but it was also started, of course, in the, in, at the same time, but it was, since it had already been designed, uh, it was not much of a job to get it going quicker. So it was um, uh, finished about 1935, whereas Tiger not until 1938. So this served as a model. And you can see what they're doing here in Norris Dam building it. They're building it as monoliths. Now, this is a little bit different than we saw with those big western dams, where they were built in blocks, you remember. Here they're built in what they call, they call the, to the term monolith, so that it's a, a huge block like this. Now, this is, of course, much smaller. These are much smaller than the Grand Coulee, Shasta, Hoover Dam types that we've seen before. But they're still a very substantial dam. Next slide. Um, and so while that's going on, the Corps of Engineers is grappling with the design of the Tiger Dam. And again, they're under the same kind of pressure in all the, that they were in these other dams, so that they were uh, told, in effect, to get people to work in the field while they evolved the design. Uh, a, a rather scary operation for the designers to know that the things are being done in the field that they can't change and uh, they, they haven't yet figured out the design. And the most important aspect for the design of a dam like this is the foundations. That's one most important example. Of course the stability and the sliding and the overturning are important, but they're so massive, these dams, that that, as you know from your computations, uh, does not turn out usually to be a major problem. Next slide on the left. So now let's go back to that and again orient ourselves. Here's Pittsburgh, here is the Monongahela River, and here are the two branches, the West Fork and the Tigert, that make up the Monongahela, and on the Tigert down here is where the dam is, in, well embedded in West Virginia. So it is going to be the, the southern uh, most important dam here compared to the Kinzua Dam up here, which we'll turn to later. Next slide on the right. And this, uh, again, this is not a slide you can really read completely, except that you'll see on it, it has a uh, lock and dam number, L and D, number one, two, three, four. It's a, a fully locked river. The Monongahela is a very important transportation artery because of the coal uh, in West Virginia. And um, <clears throat> so that uh, it, it was, a, uh, it, it was a designed just the way the Ohio is, really, with locks and dams, so that it could be, most of the season, it could be uh, navigable. And of course, part of the idea of the Tiger Dam wasn't just, it was, it was uh, not just flood control, it was also navigation. Also to store water and release it then when, when the low water season came, so there would be enough water in the Monongahela for navigation purposes. Next slide on the left. Well, here's the Tiger Dam, and it's very much like Norris Dam. It's not very different. Uh, it, uh, it's not uh, uh, <coughs> quite as high, but it's essentially the same thing. And you can see the various aspects of it. There is a, a crest here, which means there's a spillway. And then uh, on the side, it's higher. So this is the spillway in here. Uh, there is, of course, the outlet uh, down here. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff here, which I want to talk about. This, this, this is a... Um, a region here where the idea of the water spilling over and then coming down with a lot of force, a lot of turbulence, a lot of energy in other words, and how is that going to be dissipated? And so the Corps spent a lot of time worrying about that issue. Next slide on the right. So here you see the construction procedure going on. There's nothing particularly unusual about this except the Corps is doing it. It's a big one for the Corps. It's pretty much the same way as the Friant Dam and even Grand Coulee. That is to say, the concrete is being brought out along a trestle. It's not in a very deep valley, so it's not coming from up there like it was at, uh, at Hoover Dam. 
And, uh, <clears throat> but you can also see that it's being built in monoliths, just as the NAR stand was. You can partly see that, I guess. Uh, you can see those big monoliths jutting out, and um, part of the water being allowed to go through. Again, there's not a very big flow in the Tiger River, so it was the diversion problem was not a great one. Next slide on the left. Here you see the monoliths as they're being built. So there's a monolith and another one next to it and so forth. And the question of when you build it like that, what you're doing is you're building, you're putting a huge weight on the foundations uh, in one place and not in the next, right next to it. And so the, there's a lot of discussion in the reports of the consulting engineers as to the foundation, the stability of these foundations. Uh, were they going to be able to, were, this, were there going to be differential settlement? Was it going to crack the dam? and so forth. So this is an important issue and there wasn't too much precedent. Remember before this period, before the early 1930s, there weren't that many of these big dams and certainly not in the east and certainly not done by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, next slide on the right. Here again you see part of the construction going on. Next slide on the left. And now you get a view again of the monoliths, separate monoliths, so the water could go through you see during uh, during the design, and um, uh, but now you can see this other stuff that I wanted to talk about. And what's happening is that this is, of course, the central part in here is the spillway. It'll be the spillway. The gates, uh, the uh, the dam, the rest of the dam will be higher when it's finished. These are the so-called training walls on either side, and this is a little dam down here, which is called a weir dam. Well, you already know what a weir is, and um, <clears throat> so the idea is the water comes over the spillway. There are, it's not too easy to see it, but there are baffles in here. You can see them there. There are baffles that are supposed to break up the sweep of the water coming down. And then this stilling basin, that is to say there is therefore something of the order of, I guess it's 20, 30 feet of water formed by the weir there, formed by that little dam, so that that's a body of water into which the spillway will dump its water. Presumably very fast running, dropping uh, spillway will run into this stilling basin. Now, how to calculate all that? Well, how to calculate? They didn't know how to calculate it. And so they had, they hired the, the Carnegie Institute of Technology, now Carnegie Mellon University, the Carnegie Institute of Technology uh, in Pittsburgh, a natural place for the Pittsburgh district, and they built a set of models, many of them, uh, tens and tens of different models of this kind of a system, small scale models, that were to try to determine what, how best to still the water, the water coming off of the spillway. So they spent a lot of time and uh, in, in, a, in a sort of a dual sense, a lot of energy uh, to uh, determine the proper thing. And this is what the consultants in the Corps were very <laughs> upset about in the sense that they're building this thing as these tests are going on. And uh, they're worried that they're going to have to tear it down and do something else if there's some, uh, something found in the tests that decide against this. Well, of course, they knew pretty well where to start and uh, they could hold off this final construction till the end, but, <clears throat> but it was still a risk they were taking. Next slide on the right. And there the, the dam is just about finished. And next slide on the left. Here you see it now already in operation and you remember that the look down there at the water. Uh, Professor Smith pointed this out last time that the level uh, which one could take as a normal level is way below the dam. And that uh, the history has been the dam has never spilled. Uh, so that uh, <coughs> this is a very conservative, uh, very conservative design. What you see down here of course is the, are the outlet. Uh, the outlet tunnels, the water is going through there, they're controlling it of course, and they're letting water out. That's the whole idea, to control the water that, that comes down up the river then, down the river. And uh, you can see it is flowing all right, coming out of that, but not over top. So the, di the problem of the stilling basin is much reduced. Still there's a problem there, there's a lot of force coming out of that water because it's still ahead behind it. So there's a lot of force coming out, but it's not quite the same as if it were spilling down there, tearing down that spillway. Next slide on the right. Now I want to point out uh, uh, this, so you can see the whole thing there in diagrammatic form, but the Corps of Engineers was concerned at this time, uh, this was their first big dam, 
And so, first of all, they were concerned technically. And we get that sense, the big technical issues, the foundations, one, and the spilling basin, uh, that whole issue is t uh, two of the problems that engage their attention. But they were also concerned about the looks of the dam. And they decided that they should do something about that. So they hired Paul Cray, C-R-E-T, Paul Cray, who was a very famous French architect who had been trained in France, came to this country in the early part of the 20th century, settled in Philadelphia, where he became a professor at the School of Architecture there, and also became a designer, noted designer. Um, any of you visited the University of Texas in Austin? Anybody ever been there? Okay, well, that is the, 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 the main architectural campus was designed by Paul Cray. It's a kind of a classical design. And, uh, but he was also noted for working on works of engineering. And the Ben Franklin Bridge, uh, which um, in Philadelphia, if you look carefully, you'll see the anchor blocks there are, are worked on. That is to say, they're given uh, treatment, which we would call an architectural treatment, a visual treatment by an architect. And uh, so they hired him. And what you see here in this dam are these little arcades here and uh, the little towers, and they're all worked a little bit. That is to say, uh, if you had just done, they could have been designed straight. You don't need arcades there. You don't need arches. That's not, uh, those spans are very short. They could easily have been done with reinforced concrete beams. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, but that was uh, what he added to the design. Uh, it's the only case that I know of where an architect played a role, visual role, in such a big dam. There was, in Hoover Dam, there was an architect involved, but he played a very much more, much less of a role uh, than here. These are quite prominent, this, this, uh, these side, uh, this side galleries here on the top. Uh, <coughs> next slide, please. Well, here you see him even more. And uh, the engineers the, were, were uh, of course, they were interested in having this done, but they were not so happy that it took a while for this design to appear and they were trying to get this thing built, trying to get people in the field, people to build it. And again, here was a case of design holding up the construction to some extent, not a great extent, but to some. Next slide on the left. And here you see very clearly this stilling basin and these, uh, the, still, the spillway here, the openings. You can't, it's hard to see the openings. They're down there all right. The water coming out of those openings. Uh, <clears throat> next slide on the right. So you get an idea of this design. All right, that's the Tiger Dam. I want to now turn to the other dam, the Kinzua Dam. This is, again, this aerial view of the Mississippi River. That must be taken by a satellite, huh? But I'm amazed that the river is so wide. It isn't really that wide. It's a Don't topographic you? image that's been enhanced. It's being massaged? OK. Massaged photographic image, fine. <laughs> All right, next slide on the left. But it certainly brings out the, the location of it very well. So here's Tiger on the south, next slide on the right. And now we're going to look at Kinzua Dam in the north. Not a particularly interesting dam. That is to say, doesn't bring us much. Uh, you can see the little spillway there. Uh, the dam itself is much smaller than Tiger. It had very little in the way of, uh, of, of these big problems. Uh, but it had another set of problems associated with it. Next slide on the left. And uh, <clears throat> so let's locate it. It's up here on the little Kinzua Creek, uh, the top of the Allegheny, uh, which is the, of course, main feeder down here from the north for forming the Ohio River. You will also notice there are lots of dams up to, uh, this is head of slack water, which means head of the navigable part of the river. From there on, it's not navigable. And therefore, this is a flood control dam. That's the, pr the, the major aspect of that dam. It also has some navigation meaning for the same reason that Tiger does as well, but less in this case. So what was the issue here? Well, the issue was that this land up here, this is a big lake formed here. And that, the land that was inundated by that lake belonged to the Seneca Indians. The Seneca tribe had been granted this land by treaty, a treaty signed by George Washington, no less, in the late 18th century. And uh, <clears throat> the Corps of Engineers uh, and the, well, let's say the US government, we have to say, simply took that land. Uh, they 
there were compensations and so forth, but they, in, the Indians were not happy at all with that. Uh, they uh, took a lawsuit. This is a complicated uh, political issue, which I won't go into right now, but the point was they were, they were very upset with uh, losing this land, and uh, they hired a consultant, somebody that they thought would uh, know about these water issues, and it turns out somebody who was not as friendly as he might have been to the Corps of Engineers. Guess who he had they hired? Hmm. How about Arthur Morgan? That's who they hired. Next slide. So I just show you a slide here with Arthur Morgan in the middle. Uh, you know, Senator Norris and Lilienthal on the left, but Morgan in the middle. He's already, of course, been fired by, the, by Roosevelt from the TVA. And uh, he is called by the Seneca Indians to develop an alternate plan for flood control. And his plan consists of diverting the river this way to the north and into Lake Erie. It's quite a complicated plan, and there was a big debate about it. It was carried to the Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of the U.S. government and not in favor of the Indians, and the Kinzua Dam was built. It became a national issue when Hugh Downs, on his uh, program, I think you still have heard of Hugh Downs, right? That's a name that's still known to you. But he was already known in the 1960s when this issue came up, and he popularized, popularized this on radio and television, and it became quite a national issue that was finally settled when Hugh Downs uh, met with the Corps of Engineers and they discussed the whole issue with him. And he retracted uh, some of his language, but not his basic argument that it had been unfair to the Indians. So it, it remains a, uh, a, a, this kind of problem, and this kind of problem existed on the Missouri River, you remember, where the, uh, uh, the Arakara Indians and other tribes, their land was taken for the building of these uh, large dams. So this is, you might say, almost the end of that era now. This is the 1960s when this is done, and, um, uh, and of course completed, uh, so that, next slide on the left, uh, and uh, on the left, uh, the, uh, I'm going to end with this one. Uh, now the dam itself, which uh, you, you see this, I'm showing you this wall here. Well, what's interesting to us about this wall is it was an innovation at the time, and it's a slurry wall, a bentonite slurry wall. Now, there's a very famous bentonite slurry wall construction that, uh, does anybody have any idea where that is? Well, it is in fact the basic foundation for the World Trade Center. And those walls were built this way, and they're worried about those walls now because all the, res all the uh, bracing was taken down, was destroyed in the, in the disaster. But this is the innovation for it. Now what it means is this bentonite material, this is a soft kind of material, and uh, <clears throat> it's put down in this hole, and it actually, uh, it's actually strong enough so that the walls of dirt won't come in. You can, you, it holds its form. And then you can cast concrete in it, and concrete is much heavier, so the concrete will drop down and this bentonite slurry will come out, in effect, and you'll end up, as the concrete rises, with a concrete wall. So that it's a way of building, this is a very deep wall. Uh, it's a way of building a wall like this without expensive uh, excavation and forming, uh, particularly the forming, I have to excavate it, but the forming, and uh, then it's a simple way to do it. The concrete flows in, the bentonite comes out, and uh, this strange material. It is also happens to be the material that's underneath Fort Peck Dam that, because it's, it, it, it is a very slippery material that is, was part of the reason for the slide. So uh, the last thing, next slide on the right, and I'm not going to do any more of this, is uh, <coughs> no, uh, forward, uh, forward, yeah, that's it is just to look at the upper Mississippi River. It's in your reading. I don't think we're a little over time now anyway, and uh, I won't go through it, but the whole upper Mississippi has a series of locks and dams that look just like that. They're across the river. They're very low dams. Uh, they're for the purpose of creating navigation, essentially navigation, not even much flood control in this case, because it is a heavy navigable area just like the Ohio. Okay.